Hello and welcome to today's webinar on Innovative Approaches to Extension in Organic and Sustainable Agriculture by Bruna Irene Grimberg and Fabian Manaled of Montana State University. This is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org. This presentation is being recorded and you'll be able to find the recording on our website and on the eOrganic YouTube channel within about one week. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a very quick overview of how today's webinar will work. The presentation will last about 45 minutes and then after that we'll have time for your questions. We'll be reading the questions out loud after the presentation is over and we'll answer as many as we have time for. During the webinar, we'll also be having a couple of quick poll questions um, where you just click on the screen to answer and then we'll share the results right away. The presenters will also ask a few open-ended questions. So for those, we encourage you to type answers into your question box and we'll be reading them aloud. So today, we're very happy to be welcoming Bruna Irene Grimberg and Fabian Manaled. Bruna Irene Grimberg is an associate research professor dedicated to science outreach and education. She has a background in physics and education, which has allowed her to conduct research and conduct K-12 science teacher professional development in rural areas and on Native American reservations. She also teaches university level courses in physics and science education. Her research explores how people learn science in different contexts and cultural settings. Fabian Manaled is a professor of weed ecology and management at Montana State University. Fabian's research and extension interests include the assessment of agroecological principles that relate to the development of sustainable farming practices. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to our first speaker, Fabian Manaled. So Fabian, I will be giving you the control of the screen and you should have it now. All right. Well, sorry. Well, good morning. Uh, if you are west of Montana, good afternoon if you are east of Montana. And what, um, what we would like to do today is to share with you some of our experiences uh, that we have regarding developing new ideas uh, to do extension tailored for growers uh, who are interested in sustainable agriculture and organic farming. Uh, but before we start, let's see who's there in the audience. So um, if you can click or respond to this little poll, if you are a farmer or a rancher, uh, if you're an extension agent or a crop consultant, um, if you're a faculty or researcher or other, I guess, if you're a student uh, or any other profession, you can click in other. And so Alice just gave us uh, the responses and we have a sort of an even distribution between extension agents and faculty and researchers and other. Uh, I'm really interested to know uh, who are the others, but um, it's great to have a, such a wide uh, audience. So hopefully with your input, we'll have a great uh, webinar today. In our next slide, if, all right. What we are planning to do today is continue with this series of uh, excellence in organic extension a webinar series that we're giving around a year and a half ago. There are four webinars and the topics that were covered in the, those webinars are very wide. Uh, they went from how to deliver a farmer's friendly talk on how to use social media, uh, how to engage the public and how to evaluate. Uh, there will be a little bit of overlapping with those presentations, um, but what we are trying to bring here today is uh, explore a little bit more the uh, theoretical framework, the pedagogical framework uh, by which we are supporting our extension programs. So let's see um, how many of those webinars uh, did you watch or did you attend? So if you haven't watched anyone, just press none one, two, three, or if you have watched or participated online to all of them. So we more or less know what you know in advance. Um, all right, so um, for most all of you, 
this is going to be um, relatively new information they're going to be providing today, uh, which is exciting. But I strongly recommend you to go back and look at those webinars. In case you fall asleep, I want to start by giving you somehow the take-home message. And the take-home message is clearly reflected in this quote uh, that was written around 18 years ago and says that the movement towards stronger participation by farmers in agricultural research and extension is fueled by a growing realization that the socioeconomic and agroecological conditions of farmers are complex, diverse, and risk-prone. So what we'll try to address today is to incorporate these ideas of complexity, diversity, and risk. And Irene will talk a little bit about the framework, the theoretical framework. Bruna is going to be talking about this theoretical framework. So if she has the control now. OK. Uh, here we are. OK, so um, it, what we try to do right now is to provide um, a theoretical framework to develop an extension program that will reflect on Farrington's uh, reflections, on Farrington's thought. Uh, essentially, the, what we propose is to have a participatory based approach to do an extension. And the next few slides we, uh, will address uh, like three main blocks of that approach, uh, we will talk about the principles that support participatory based approaches and then we will talk about the actions that are associated with those principles and finally we look at some of the outcomes. So um, participatory based approach is uh, a movement, if you wish, that started in the late 1970s and really um, grew up out of uh, health research, uh, research mainly that was done with groups that uh, have not a great participation in, in mainstream issues. Those were marginalized groups in different places in the world. And, and this is when researchers realized that but having muted an approach, they were really shutting down a lot of wisdom and a lot of um, you know, uh, experience for many, many years and experience and wisdom that are related to particular places. So the first principle in order to have a more two-way communication between uh, the researchers and the subject of research or extension, like in this way will be researchers and farmers, um, will be to establish equitable relationships and that is based on trust building and share power. In other words, you want the, the uh, members of the systems in which you work with, uh, stakeholders, farmers, many components that of the people that really produce the activity that you want to study or do research or extension on, uh, to be at the same at the same level that that you as a researcher or student uh, are. So that is that is the first principle, equitable uh, ideas. The second principle is that this partnership between researchers or extension agents and the people that are part of the system that you want to study or do extension on, uh, the, the, that partnership has one main goal and that is the pursuit, the pursuit of new knowledge. Uh, they both working together to find solutions to problems and, and that is, is the main really driven force. And in order for this knowledge to really have any any sustainability beyond the moment that you are exploring the problem or beyond the, pr the, the time that you are um, producing that research is that self-reflection. I mean, participants, researchers, and, and, and farmers and subjects are um, working on self-reflecting in the process, in the solutions, and, and so on. Um, those principles lead to three main actions uh, in any participatory approach, and that is the collective identification of problems uh, that are local problems like 
when you work with farmers, they will know exactly uh, issues about the impact of extreme weather in the production, pests, uh, how those are related uh, to conditions of the soil and, and the weather and so on. Those are very specific local problems. The second action is that collectively um, the, the two group of people, in this case the researchers and farmers, uh, will conduct investigations. Uh, researchers will, will uh, design those experiments along with the farmers and um, those many of those experiments will take place in, in complex, real, authentic uh, context like a farm. And then again, um, kind of a, the same idea is uh, researchers and farmers are participate together in every single step of this process, in the diagnostic, in the design and experimentation, and then obviously in the dissemination of the problems. These ideas are not, not you know, new in other areas of knowledge. Um, Aguirre, she is um, a, a researcher that work on other issues, and she summarized the participatory based research and extension in those six bullets, which is pretty much uh, what, what we talked before. Identifying a problem, setting objectives, selecting solutions, implementing the project, interpreting observations, and sharing results. So what are the outcomes of, of um, of approaches like this, and this this is based on a huge body of literature that talk about the application of participatory approaches in different areas uh, of, of research and extension, for example, in health uh, areas, uh, agriculture, and so on. And and the main outcomes beyond you know particular outcomes to particular project or, or programs are the long-term collaborations between researchers, educators, and community members. This is key. This is great, by the way. It's not only because it's way more effective. Your program will be more effective and sustained, but because also a collaboration of today may, means many, many collaborations for tomorrow. So that is, that is really a very valuable partnership. The second uh, main outcome, which is also very valuable, is that um, uh, the recommendations and the dissemination of knowledge address holistic and systemic uh, issues instead of individualistic or, or very single, you know, as a, a minimalist practices. So I think that that is very, very important, in particular in, in areas like agriculture, in which you have many, many variables and parameters playing uh, uh, an impact in your system at the same time in different ways. So really to, to have um, a, a systemic view is, is absolutely key. And that is key because um, addresses a, way, a wide range of environmental and socioeconomic conditions. And uh, Fabian will talk later about his definition of agriculture in which environmental and socioeconomic conditions really are, are uh, critical to that definition and to have approaches in which different stakeholders will contribute to, uh, to the problem, to the to the experiment or the solution of the problem and then the dissemination and practice really will assure that you um, are, uh, target a wide range of variables. And last but not least, and that is um, as an educator, I see uh, that that is, that is absolutely uh, in tune with current educational reforms in which we expect from our students or from science learning students at least um, to really address problems in an authentic comp and complex context. So this, this process is, is really uh, a very good example and a very easy example to translate in, in educational material. Uh, it has a lot of potential. Now, I think that now Fabian's turn. Right. So this is uh, basically a theory. Uh, the question is how does this theory translate into our extension programs? And in order to do that, 
I don't think my screen is advancing. There it is. Okay. Um, I think we need to look at the framework where we work. And most of us work within the framework of the land grant universities and that were created around 155 years ago with this Morill Act. And the Morill Act says, among other things, that the goal is to teach agriculture and the mechanic acts arts to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes. And with this, this, within this model, uh, we have the land-grant universities, where sort of research is at the center, and extension and teaching are outcome of that research. And unfortunately, extension and teaching are not really tied. The way uh, by which we do extension for the last 150 years is by having extension specialists and extension agents going around the states in trains and in car and giving extension presentations. And this approach is very much the same that we're doing today, uh, where we, for example, in this case, bring our growers to our plots and we show them the best wheat varieties for one specific conditions that we have here in Montana. In a way, I conceive this approach to uh, extension, the because I say so approach. After all, I am the PhD, I am the faculty, I am the professor, and I should know what is good for you, right? And you, the farmer, learn. And this is okay uh, within a concept of inputs and outputs agriculture, where we want to give farmers a certain technological package uh, in the form of pesticides and fertilizers and seeds so they can maximize outputs. And actually, usually what we do is we try to maximize one output in particular, which is yield. Now, in the context of organic agriculture and sustainable agriculture, we are running out of option of pesticides. Um, also, in terms of synthetic fertilizers, we don't have them. And in the case of seeds, although there are some varieties that are uh, bred to, uh, for organic conditions, there are very few uh, options. So, um, we need to start moving forward. Still, I think we use that approach uh, for one input, one output extension when we give a talk, say, in front of an, a group of extension growers. Uh, for example, we have a cover crop and we discuss for half an hour, should we till it, should we not till it? Which is a very important question, but it's not solving all the problems. Because what we are doing if we have this type of input-output uh, extension, is we're providing knowledge in these sort of isolated and old silos. But it happens that reality is more complex, and we may not be able to capture the whole reality in that. So do we need to do that, like this cartoon is saying? Is it right to remain ignorant, or do we need to grasp the whole complexity of the system? And I think it's important to try to get the complexity of the system because, for example, you can see here we have a leaf uh, and with our uh, reductionist approach to extension, uh, we'll be talking a lot of things about that specific leaf, but without knowing where it is located, we may be giving really wrong uh, recommendations. And in a way, what we need to do is to emulate uh, the, appro the approach by which farmers think and make decisions. And when they do that, they think and make decisions many times in isolation. We have this farmer in Texas uh, farming several thousand of acres, and he's seeing a problem, this yellow patch, and he may be thinking, well, could this be worse? Um, why I have this problem? It's just a fertility issue or maybe it's a pathogen, or maybe it's a pathogen and a fertility issue, or some insects are around. Um, how do I manage that? Uh, can I manage at the same time the pathogens and the fertility issue? It's going to cost me money. Will it pay off? Maybe yes, maybe not. But most importantly, what will happen if I don't do it? Um, what will happen next year? Can I prevent this problem to become you know, a, 
a common issue in my farm every year, every after one year after the other. Now, I think it's very fascinating that this thought process that a farmer is having in Texas in this large-scale farm is the same thought process that a farmer is having when he farms, say, two acres in a highly diversified vegetable farm. The questions are very similar. So if the questions are similar, is, is there a unifying principle to extension in organic and sustainable agriculture that we can apply? And I think there is one, and in order to find it, we need to go back to that definition of the uh, written by uh, Moriel, and we looked at what he's saying is that we need to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes. Now, I don't know what was his, in his mindset 153 years ago, um, but I know that today, when we talk about liberal education, we talk about an approach to learning that empowers individuals and prepares them to deal with complexity, diversity, and change. And when we talk about complexity, diversity, and change, we're talking basically about agroecosystem management. So in order to do that, what we need to have is change our approach to extension. We need to develop a new approach to extension. And if we do that, we need to redefine what farming is. Instead of having these input-output definitions that we would want to just maximize outputs, I think this is a good definition. Um, it's adapted by Galloping and Robertson that says that farming is a socio-ecological system-level enterprise with system-level responses. And when we are talking about those system-level responses, we are not just talking about yields, but we are talking about other ecosystem services, such as um, soil health, water quality, air quality, some aesthetic values, preservation of pollinators. So if we're going to be doing you know, the system-level evaluations, what we need to do is to develop a system-level extension program. And this is not a new idea. Um, I don't know if you're familiar or not with this book. Uh, it was published around, I don't know, 45, 50 years ago, which is the general system theory. Uh, von Bernthalanffy studied this idea of thinking that, you know, we need to consider the whole components uh, at the same time and their interactions. And I think it can be briefly summarized in this great cartoon. At the base of this cartoon, we have this woman measuring with a tape, uh, sort of, for example, measuring which uh, crop variety you should be using, right? It will give us the building blocks of our understanding. We need to know how plants grow, which is the best plant for your specific uh, farming. That's a focus inquire type of research. That's a focus inquire type of extension. But at one point, what we need to do is we need to start climbing that ladder and in a way put everything into the context and start seeing the whole system that this person at the top is doing with a telescope. And when we do that, we get into a systemic knowledge where we're able to address the causes and the consequences of our actions. So again, this is theory, but let's see how this work in the real world. How can we do extension with this approach of systemic and system level uh, research and extension? So um, before I, I continue, let's see how familiar are you with these ideas. Um, let's see, have you ever used a system level perspective in your extension programs? Click always. If you always do it sometimes, you know, if you do it once in a while or you never hear about these ideas. So let's see where we are. Um, I don't know if Alice can give me the answers. All right, so that's that's great, you know, around 70% of, uh, of us use these ideas of, uh, of uh, system level uh, extension program, which is fantastic because I will be asking some questions of what you do at the end, so stay tuned. All right. 
what we are going to do now is I'm going to be giving two examples. One is a survey uh, that we conducted uh, to see how producers, researchers, and consultants think and make decisions. And then one specific extension exercise that we did where we ask people to think at the system level of analysis so they can have to solve problems at the multi-trophic pest levels. And I explained that uh, language in a second. So again, talking what Bruna said a few slides ago, uh, we'll be using this survey to identify local problem problems. And then we are asking farmers how they think and then in a community, we try to find a solution for those problems. Let's start with a survey. Um, basically, um, it was a couple of years ago that the Organic Advisory and Education Council uh, created these two surveys. One was for organic vegetable growers, and the other one was for small grain growers. So, you know, the first one for people uh, for farms in two to three acres, the other ones we're talking about two to three thousand acres. Uh, and with support from the OAC and Western Surrey, uh, we got the survey and basically uh, decided to expand it. Uh, this, the original survey, basically have 25 questions, uh, which were multiple choice questions. Um, they were basically asking the farmers, how many acres do you farm, uh, how many crops, uh, how many years have you been organic? So very um, specific questions that in a way will define the context where they farm. And then there were 12 open-ended questions um, where they uh, they were asking basically um, how you solve a problem. So if you have an issue related to perennial with management, what do you do? So in a way, what we consider them is uh, quest uh, questions that relate to mental processes or thought processes. So what we decided to do is to expand this survey not just for organic growers, but we also ask conventional growers and researchers and extension specialists and crop consultants and try to see if there's a commonality among these groups. Uh, we have a total of 272 responses. Um, basically, 13% uh, were researchers, that's 37 people, 103 Around 38% uh, were conventional producers, uh, 21 uh, uh, were organic vegetable producers, 33 uh, were organic uh, small grain, and crop consultants, we have 78. So we have, a, I think, a pretty good representation of the farming community here in Montana. So the question now is, are different agricultural professionals thinking about uh, agronomic challenges similarly or not? And how do we analyze that? Well, remember those 25 questions that I said, they gave us the context where they were farming. Question one will be, how many acres? Question two, how many crops? And we have 272 responses. What we can do is just look at one response at, at a time and we will have this type of uh, bar graph. Uh, this is what the organic, organic growers did with the original survey, uh, and they see how many years they've been farming organically, between four to six years, around 25% of the people. That gives us a, an idea of, uh, of the organic community, but not about the interconnections between uh, problems and issues. So in order to do that, uh, we may want to start analyzing two variables at the same time. For example, in this uh, theoretical graph I'm showing here, say we have the number of acres versus the number of years, and each dot represents one person. So for example, this person here is a researcher um, who is interested in very few acres and has been associated with the university for very few years. This guy here, um, deals with, say, 2,000 acres, and it's probably a food professor who's been associated with the university for many years. So we can start seeing some connections between uh, acres and number of years uh, that you've been dealing with this problem. 
but we can we will want to see more associations, say in this case three variables at the same time, and we'll be representing here the number of crops, the number of acres, and the number of years. And for example, this organic uh, large-scale guy here is farming this number of acres, and has this number of crops, and he's been farming for very few years. So again, we start to see some connections in this theoretical example. We may start to see some uh, clustering of the groups. But remember, we have 25 variables that define the context. Question here is, how do we analyze 25 answers at the same time? How we do that? And in order to do that, we use uh, what is called multivariate analysis. And I don't know if you're familiar or not with multivariate analysis. Analysis will run this little poll uh, where if you have used the idea of uh, ordination, ordination sorry, of clustering, um, you're then very familiar. If you know what I'm talking, you will be somewhat familiar. Or if you never heard about this concept, uh, you're not familiar at all. So let's see how familiar are you. OK, so um, around, I would say, 63% are between very familiar and somewhat familiar. Those 37% uh, who never heard this concept, uh, what I'm going to do now, um, if Alice gives me the uh, presentation again, in the screen. Thank you, Alice. I'm going to use the next two seconds to explain something that could take us two months. But basically, the idea is that if we can represent things in three dimensions uh, and we can visualize them when we put them in these two dimensions, like I'm, we are seeing here now in the screen, uh, we can do the same with four and five and even 25 dimensions. The problem is we cannot represent them. But the mathematical rules are the same. So what this technique does, uh, which is called in this particular case uh, non-metric multidimensional scaling, doesn't matter, but you can see here the acronym here, is it represents in three dimension, 25 dimension. It summarizes this 25 dimension in a way where we can visualize it. And when we do that, now, we start to see some association. We can see that the researchers in their context issues, their context questions are somehow, somehow clustered. Um, the consultants are a little more spread. The conventional growers appear to be even more spread, but in one you know, side of the graph, right? Now in the left side of the graph, what we have is the organic small-scale growers and the organic large-scale growers. So it appears that there's a big division between researchers, consultants, and organic growers. But actually, what we can do is we can rotate this figure, and when we can see it in three dimension, you can start seeing that there's actually some overlaps here. Some conventional growers tend to think very similar or have the same context than some conventional growers. And some researchers are somehow out there, the one that I'm trying to follow now. So again, this is the context where the farming operation is done. The other set of questions, the 12 open questions, was the uh, mental processes or the thought processes. How do we analyze that? How do we see if people conceive belonging to each one of these group uh, perceive issues similarly and analyze them and try to solve them similarly or not. And in order to do that, we use a second multivariate technique, which is classification. And basically, uh, what we have here is a farmer and a researcher. And the farmer will be giving his or her responses, the same for the research. And what we can do is we can see how many answers were the same versus the total number of answers they were, they were answering. So if only three questions were in common from the 12, then there's not many similarities. If you know 11 questions gave the same answers, then they think very similarly. So what we do is we start grouping people by seeing the person in those 272 
uh, responses that we have that thought similarly. Then we clustered with those that think not that similar, but at least some, somewhat similar, and we keep doing this ordination. And this sort of uh, PC graph is basically doing an ordination. You can see here the 272 uh, responses that we have, the five groups that I mentioned before, and in order to, um, and the closer you are, the similar you are with your neighbor. This guy here thinks very different than this guy over here. But what we do is we decide this is how this red line is going to be the clustering line. We'll define groups at that level. And what we found is a group mostly composed by researchers and consultants, then two groups of uh, basically a mixed groups of mostly conventional growers, but there were some researchers and consultants there. Then we have some organic growers. Very similar to them, we have a few researchers and some, again, similar to them, some conventional growers. So much to our surprise, in terms of how you solve the, the open-ended questions, some conventional growers tend to think very similar to a few organic growers and a few researchers. So sort of the take-home message of this is that um, you know, the traditional researchers and consultants get their farming information mostly from media outlets and uh, the most important issues are soil research issues. They are interesting in how do they uh, maximize uh, their inputs and outputs. The organic group uh, was mostly interested in wheat research. They were specifically interested here in Montana with perennial wheat, field buying wheat, and Canada thistle are the two most important issues for them. And they are actually conducting uh, on-farm research on managing those specific weeds. And the alternative uh, research group um, was interesting in what we call agroecological issues such as competitions, and some of them were interested in herbicide resistance. Our findings were very interesting um, because we found that some conventional growers, again, think similarly as some organic producer. So the take-home message is that you need to find your partner in the coffee shop. Uh, also, some researchers uh, span their interests across conventional organic issues. So our recommendation for uh, organic growers is that they need to find your partner within the state university. And for researchers, they need to go and talk with those organic and conventional growers um, that are dealing with the same issues that they are concerned with. And very interestingly, consultants did not associate with anyone, uh, so they need to refocus their attention to get in touch with both conventional and organic producers as well as with researchers. So question now is how do we bridge this gap that we're seeing between farmers, researchers, and consultants? Second question is how can we stimulate a dialogue between organic and conventional farmers? Remember, there were some farmers, organic and conventional, that thought about the same issues, the same problems. And how can we foster system thinking? So I think a great example of fostering this idea of system thinking is in this book, Agroecology in Action, by Keith Warner. So have you read this book? Um, press yes or no if you have or have not read this book. So let's see what the responses are. OK. For those 98%, uh, please go to Amazon right now and buy this book. I think it's one of the best books uh, that I ever read related to how to do extension. Uh, Keith Warner basically, in a nutshell, what he says is that we need to think outside the box. And farmers think think outside the box and start developing their own networks of farmers when they're faced with problems that cannot be solved with a traditional approach to extension, that input-output extension problems. When they have these complex issues, they 
form groups, they, they, they talk with their neighbors, and they find a common solution for that specific problem. He gives a lot of examples of, uh, from California, um, but I think those examples can be used anywhere in the world. And this is a way uh, by which we adapt these uh, ideas here in an exercise we did a few years ago uh, in Montana. Uh, we have our crop and pest management school where we have farmers, um, some conventional farmers, a few organic farmers, some extension agents, and some people coming from the industry. So a wide audience. We have around 75 people attending that school. And we show them a picture of our traditional system here in Montana. Uh, wheat and fallow, our goal is to have great yields. That's a traditional you know, input-output extension. And we say, well, let's say, what happens if you have wheat, say, wild oat? The problem there is that it's going to be a competition. That's an ecological problem between the moisture, the nutrient, and the light. And for those of uh, in the audience which are conventional growers some people coming from the in industry, the issue is that these specific wild oats happen to have multiple herbicide resistance. This is they are resistant to every single selective herbicides that we have in Montana. This is true. We have them here. So there's basically no herbicide solution there. Let's start thinking outside the box. Now, the problem is that farmers have more than one problem at the same time. Say they have a pathogen, Fusarium can root. And my pathogens, uh, plant pathologist uh, friends, their recommendation is to decrease seeding rate so that there will be less moisture stress and less uh, problem with the pathogen. The problem is that when you decrease seeding rate, you decrease competition and therefore you increase the chances of having more weeds. So what helps in one direction kills or hurts you in the other direction. Now very interestingly, Fusarium uh, uses wild oats as an alternative host, so it kills the wild oats, and we can think that fusarium, the pathogen, is then a biological control agent of our weeds. So we start seeing this multitrophic relationship here, and things are more complex because we also have insects, such as the wheat stem sawfly, which overwinters in, in wheat. It's a major problem, but also, um, and there are some, some options. Uh, the problem is that those solid stem varieties have low yield potential, low competitive ability, so if you use them, you tend to have uh, more weeds. And if you increase your seeding rate, so you can compete with your weeds, you lose the solidness of the stems, and you increase the fissuring pressure. So you can see there's a lot of connections here. And most importantly, <coughs> the fissurium actually kills the wheat stem sawfly and the parasite. That's a complex ecological problem. So we show our farmers and extension agents and crop consultants and industry representatives these problems, and we divide them in groups. We make sure that uh, they were talking with someone outside the you know, area of comfort. So we put a grower with, a, with an extension agent and, and a crop consultant, and we told them, giving one specific goal, Say, for example, maximize yield or um, secu uh, increase soil health, your task is to manage multiple herbicide resistant wild oats, fusarium cron root, and with some soft light. That was a complex question. And what I would like you to do is uh, to type, I think you have a little box there. Unmuted. And type what will be your recommendation. Uh, if you're faced with these complex problems. Uh, and I think Alice um, can start reading us the question as they come. Yeah, although they may need a few minutes to think about that, Yeah, so. to think about these problems. It so is a complex I'm, question, you, yeah. Yeah, so, so I'm going to move back. Remember this uh, slide. Uh, what we have is our desired species, wheat, that is competing with uh, wild oat. We are organic growers, or in the case of conventional growers, we don't have any herbicides. We also have pathogens. If we manage for pathogens, we increase with pressure. The pathogen kills our weeds. Insects 
kills our crops, they die in the wild oat when they overwinter in wild oat. I forgot to mention that. So wild oats are beneficial to control with some saw fly and the pathogen uh, kills the with some saw fly. A complex question with multitrophic interactions. Okay. And you have the uh, the universe is the the sky is the limit for your management options. What would you recommend? So, Alice, you have some. No, I don't yet. Um, it is a pretty complex question, so it may take people a couple minutes. Um, we do have one. Um, we have a couple different ones here. So good. Um, one okay. person said, um, implement cover crops and crop rotations to break up the cycle and look at alternative and unique cash crops. Um, we have two more. One person suggested changing the crop, and another one said, rotate to corn. Um, someone else said establish refuge strips for wild oats. And another response is trap crops for the sawfly, harvesting wild oat with wheat. Um, and I'll read one more for now. Utilize diverse yeah. crop rotations. Um, are there any predators that you can introduce to feed on the insect? So thank you for those. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you it was a great exercise we did. Uh, then we asked one um, representative of each group uh, to give the answers, and it was really nice to see someone coming from the industry saying, well, what we need to do is what you just said. We need to increase crop rotation. Uh, we need to crop, crop diversity. Uh, we need to uh, include grazing. Um, so it was it was really good because uh, now we are talking about integrated crop livestock. Uh, and even those people coming from the industry perspective, they knew they have no pesticides to recommend, so they were forced to give ecologically based pest management options. And it was really good because we start a dialogue. Um, between organic growers, conventional growers, extension agents, and people from the industry. Again, coming back with the idea of uh, what uh, Keith Warner was saying, when you are forced to think outside the box, you start to find these new solutions. So, you already gave some of your recommendations. Let's go back to the initial question I asked you. Uh, 20 minutes ago. So is there any unifying principle to extension in organic and sustainable agriculture? And I think there is one. And the unifying principle is not in the answer, but it is in the question. It is how you pose the question. If you're going to ask a question which is going to be inputs, outputs, then you're not going to be coming with a system level solution. So the scope of the question is what drives the understanding of these inter and interrelationships among the different components of the agroecosystems. We ask them to solve a very complex question, and people start thinking about the relationship between a pathogen and a weed. Now the pathogen could be beneficial, and an insect, and, and the weed. So there's all this, all this relationship that the audience were forced to think. Now, the effectiveness of the response derives from the understanding of the interactions of the different agroecosystems and the stakeholders. Okay, so the um, the response will not be a type of a silver bullet type uh, of answer. Now, what you need to be having is group of neighbors facing similar issues, working together with an extension agent, working together with a researcher, trying to brainstorm and come with a common solution. And in order to do that, it will bring a sustainable practice that will be drive by adaptive management. In a way, what we're asking is farmers then need to do some on-farm research and see how these ideas adapt to the specific of their management practices, and then we come back, we we'll re-meet, and we we'll really discuss these questions. So I will ask um, the audience if they can give us an example of, of a system-level question that will drive this type of uh, system-level extension program. So if you can type, and I will leave a couple of uh, seconds because it may 
it may take a couple of uh, minutes to think. But again, remember, the question is what's going to be driving your extension program. And is Alice? Um, I don't see any yet, although, um, yeah, certainly um, feel free to type in an answer. It may yeah. take a minute or two to think about yeah. that. Yeah. And, uh, so I'll go to go back to this idea in, uh, that I just mentioned, that we need to think in a really broad question that will force people to think outside the, the box. Okay, we have one here. Okay, um, good. How to implement new ag policies to protect our watersheds from CAFO, manure runoff, etc. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, I don't know the answer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's great. Um, how Any do other? we manage organic pastures and herds in the face of drought? Perfect. Yeah. Any any other question? Well, let's let's move on. Okay, one more. Um, let's see. We have a comment here. Give to receive is the philosophy of organic agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, how can we improve soil health and organic vegetable production? Um, what are good cover crops for surface irrigated onions? Look at water, soil production. How can biodiversity on farm landscapes be increased in order to support populations of natural enemies? Yeah. And uh, one more, um, working on community-based food system change, how do we promote local support for increasing healthy food? Those are great questions. Thank you so much. And now Bruna will start finalizing the presentation. So if Alice, you can give the control to her. Yep, I think that uh, I okay. have the control. Yep, you've got it now. Okay. So um, thank you for the questions. Really uh, keep me thinking. And this slide is kind of tried to wrapping up what we talk about, how this claim that the nature of the question drives the type of extension aligns with the principles of participatory research. Um, so for example, when we talk about the scope of the question, um, uh, even in, in the examples that you gave, uh, the, the, the inclusion of many variables, of many subjects of the question uh, is a driving for new knowledge. So uh, the questions are formulated uh, such that um, you will need to solve problems and those solutions will constitute new knowledge. Uh, the second um, aspect or the second um, uh, nature of the extension, if you wish. Uh, Fabian talked about the effectiveness of the response and that meaning uh, having on board different stakeholders of this socio and agronomical um, complex that farming is. And that really speaks very well to the notion of equity that we saw in participatory based research. Uh, the fact that everybody has a say and everybody um, is part of the solution, is aligns with this equity idea. And then um, a, a, another um, aspect of the extension doing in, in this way that we propose is to try to come out with sustainable practices and that uh, um, this, this adaptability of the solutions on, on management recommendations has to do with self-reflection in participatory based research in which people really think of how one experience can be adapted and transferred to a new problem. So um, what we try to show here is how those two align and by the way, the research and experience from participatory based work can be transposed in some regard to extension. So if we, if we go back to this logic model of, of a participatory based research that we talked in the very beginning, uh, we see that there is a two-way avenue uh, between extension and participatory based research and those are the shared principles that we just talked. Uh, those lead to changes in practices um, that will be of such nature, I mean they will be sustainable practices and in the long run those sustainable practices that will be adopted and adapted by a large group of people and in different 
context, uh, eventually they will lead to the improvement of environmental and social conditions, and those were the two tenets or the core of the definition of farming that Fabian used before. So what we can say essentially that an extension based on participatory based ideas in the long term will impact farming in the, in the way we see here. Um, I would like to end with a piece from uh, Agroecology in Action book from Warner, and this really wraps what we have been saying in the last hour. Um, agroecology can be effectively put into action only when network of farmers and scientists learn together about the local ecological conditions. Agroecology cannot be transferred in the way a chemical or mechanical technology can it must be facilitated by social learning. So with this, uh, we would like to thank you um, and we inviting you to, f to post more questions through this venue or to contact us uh, by email. Here you have our emails and we will be delighted to continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you both. Um, we're about to begin our question and answer session, so for anyone who missed the very beginning, um, just use the question box on your screen to type in questions and hit return, and if it's not open, just click on the small plus sign or triangle next to the word question and that will open it up. Um, I also wanted to mention um, that we really value your feedback, so we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out the follow-up survey, which you'll be receiving in an email later today. Um, this webinar is also being recorded, so if you came on late um, and you want to listen to what you missed or share it with other people, um, you'll be able to find it on our website at the link on your screen. There's also a PDF handout of the slide. Um, that's available from the second link on your screen. So um, also, um, finally, if you have general questions about organic farming that don't really have to do with this particular subject, um, please feel free to use the e-extension Ask an Expert service and you will get an answer. So um, we have some questions coming in. Um, first, um, relating to the survey that you um, sent, Fabian, um, were the conventional mm -hmm. growers that you surveyed producing vegetables or grain? No, the, uh, they're all producing grain. Um, I don't think we have many uh, conventional growers growing vegetables here in, in Montana. Uh, most of the uh, vegetable growers are organic or they, if they don't have an organic certification, they do it within uh, the framework of organic practices. So they are mostly um, conventional uh, small grain growers. Good question. Okay. Um, we had a question about how people can find the previous um, presentations on extension in the series um, that Fabian mentioned. And there was a slide early on, but if you just go to that top link on the screen right now, um, they are available in the eOrganic webinar archive along with many other organic farming and research presentations. So um, they're also organized by topic at that link. There's another link you can click there that says by topic, and there's a topic called extension, and so you should be able to find them right there. Um, okay, um, as a researcher, a key challenge in transitioning to a better extension model is finding funding for participatory research, which requires launching a project without interventions in mind, and systems-oriented research, which obviously falls outside traditional funding boxes. Do you have any general tips or specific suggestions for where to find financial support for this type of work? Um, I think there are. Um, we've been relatively successful um, in getting support from uh, Western, because we are in the Western region, from Western SARE. You know, the SARE is the Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education Program. Uh, there are different, um, different programs, and I can't remember all of them from the top of my head. Um, actually, I think um, I have a, I have a, a little card with me, they just sent me. Uh, one is a research and education uh, program, the other one is a professional development program, the other one is a farming and rancher and a professional and producer program. There's different programs and for example the professional and producer program, if I recall correctly, uh, they try to match five producers 
with one professional and they are basically question driven by the producers with research developed by the producers with um, you know technical support from the professional so they are very much in line with this idea of, of um, on-farm research, holistic thinking. Um, we got uh, support from OREI, the Organic uh, Research and Education Program from USDA, and transition to organic in the past. Um, so I think, I think there are several panels uh, which are open to these ideas. We were able to get some support there. Thank you for the question. Okay, great. Um, we had another contribution of a systems question here. Um, how do we assist conventional crop producers with volatility of commodity grain markets by showing possibilities of markets in organic and IP grains and the production challenges? Um, not sure if you meant that as a question for the speaker, but I think it came in the context of the um, systems question. So mm -hmm. I'm going to assume that's one of those. Um, if anybody has additional questions, feel free to type them into the question box. Um, we had a couple of questions, oh, we had a couple of sort of general comments here um, about the need to ensure economic empowerment of organic farmers across the world and not to be consumed about feeding the world if we shall poison it with chemicals. So um, here's another one. Um, how to get in touch with the larger economic the larger organic community? Okay. Um, well, I, I first of all, if anyone has an answer to these questions, just type in it. It doesn't mean that I have the answer. I'm just going to give my uh, opinions about the issues. But please, so I think we still have around um, 80 people online. So please let us know what you what you think. Um, I, I think the most important thing is to first develop this local network. That's what Keith Warner is saying, uh, because people who share a commonality in terms of the market where they want to uh, sell their products or the environment where they're farming will be finding similar uh, problems. But there's also several um, regular uh, meetings. Uh, one is the Moses. Uh, conference where uh, there are lots and lots, I don't know how many, but thousands perhaps, uh, of organic growers um, going together, uh, meeting together. Um, I, I don't know if any state has an uh, organic association, uh, at least in the states where I lived before. Um, they tend to be um, a group of growers interested in organic agriculture or sustainable agriculture. Uh, I'm thinking in the example of, for example, the practical farmers of Iowa, uh, not necessarily uh, organically uh, related, but uh, very much interesting into sustainable agriculture. Uh, there's the Montana Organic Association. So there's a lot of uh, local and regional um, communities. Again, uh, Sare has four regions, uh, and perhaps you may want to contact with your state representative for the Sare program which will then get you in touch with your regional coordinator and, you know, uh, then you can start working on those networks. But uh, if anyone has an idea, please. Yeah, I, I want to add something else. Also, if you are associated with the university, uh, you can contact the extension office of the university and they will have a good inventory of different associations and groups in your area. And I think that that would be an effective way to go. Yeah, there's definitely some examples coming in um, here in Florida. There's a group called Florida Organic Growers um, in Illinois and also in Ohio. They have Organic Growers Association. So many different regions have um, groups. Um, here's another suggestion, which would be to diffuse research results through organic agriculture community newsletters, online, magazines, and through social media links. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thanks for those. Um, and, and that was one of the, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Alice, no that problem. was one of the findings of the survey where people were obtaining the information and producers, of course, they, they, they get most of their information in coffee shops and, uh, you know, local uh, magazines and newspapers, yeah. That was one of the uh, uh, things we saw in the survey. 
Yeah, um, one of the listeners shared the link to the Moses, um, so I put that in the chat box there for people if you're in the Midwest. Um, okay, here's another question. Um, can you provide examples of smaller research-oriented organizations practicing effective agroecological research using limited resources? Um, I think the, the two that I mentioned, uh, one is the Practical Farmers of Iowa, uh, and the other ones will be all the networks that are described um, in, in that book, Agroecology in Action. Um, here in Montana, we have the organic um, uh, or OAEC, Organic Advisory Education Council. Those are the ones who basically got together um, and did the survey, and then they sort of uh, contact us, and we start brainstorming of what things, what can we do. They came to us and say, can you do, for example, a meta-analysis on on canna thistle and field buying with management and and so, you know, those those are examples of a very small group of people with a really limited budget, but they came with very specific uh, questions. Um, they contact, in our case, uh, us, but I know that the Practical Farmers of Iowa have a lot of contact within uh, um, Iowa State University. So, yeah, there, there's, there's definitely, there are definitely many groups. Those are three that come to my mind. Actually, uh, Keith Warner described many, many uh, different groups that were formed in California. Okay, if anybody else has a question, we still have a few more minutes, so um, feel free to type it into the question box. If you're still online, we still have quite a few people, so if you'd like to continue the discussion by submitting a question or comment. Um, we don't have so many, so um, yours will probably get answered. So. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, here's one. This isn't really related to the topic of this webinar, but if you want to comment on this, um, it says, um, why not promote self-organic certification by farmers? Um, I don't have the answer. I think it's a regulatory issue. Um, yeah, you know, then we, we need to talk about why USDA is doing what it's doing, and that's not yeah it's kind of out of the scope what, what I do all right wait at night but yeah that's that's a that's a good question I heard a lot of people who are you know I, I mentioned before that many of the organic growers we have for vegetable organic growers here in Montana um, do organic practices but they don't care about the uh, organic certification because their clients are you know they sell in local markets and they know the people who buy them so they don't need that certification. So okay. Um, what is the name of the advisory group in Montana that you mentioned? Okay, it's called um, Organic. Um, let me let me find the exact title. It's Organic Advisory Education Council. Yeah, exactly. Organic Advisory and Education Council, OAEC. And if you send me or Bruna an email. Uh, we'll give you um, a link uh, to their website and, most, uh, and, and, and a link to, uh, and an email address of uh, a couple of people who work there. So just okay. contact us. Thank you. Um, it looks like we're pretty much out of questions now. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone who did um, submit a question and say once again that you can find our many upcoming and archived webinars on organic farming and research topics um, at the link on your screen, as well as the PDF handout um, for this webinar. And we'll be putting up the recording in the same place, as well as on the eOrganic YouTube channel. So thank you so much, um, Bruna and thank Fabian, you. for sharing your work with us. And thanks to everyone for joining us.